All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Sandesh Savam, and I'm a facial plastic surgeon at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about ZMC fractures, and um, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you all today. I have no relevant disclosures. I'm just going over our learning objectives first. Um, just want to make sure that we, by the end of this, we all understand the pertinent anatomy to ZMC fractures and be able to define what that is, what a ZMC fracture is. Um, also identify the key exam findings when seeing these patients, um, how to appropriately manage these fractures, including whether closed reduction versus open repair is warranted, um, how many points of fixation is appropriate in any given cases, and the approaches that you would want to use um, for these cases. Um, I also am going to talk about intraoperative imaging and where it can be a really useful adjunct to your practice. And we'll also touch on uh, treating orbital floors as there um, tends to be a lot of discussion on whether or not um, they need to be treated or explored. So I will be using a poll everywhere. Um, if you guys want to participate, I'd really appreciate that. Um, I think the phone texting will work best because um, some of them are going to be open responses. And so um, if you guys could do that, I'll just give you um, a little bit of time to get that set up. Okay, uh, hopefully that was enough time for you all to get set up with that. Um, so just touching on epidemiology briefly, um, it, depending on the source that you read, it's either the most common facial fracture or the second most common facial fracture uh, coming behind nasal bone fractures. Um, there's a significant uh, predilection for male patients uh, in a four to one ratio, most commonly occurring in the second or third decade of life. Um, so uh, starting with our anatomy, uh, just a quick uh, poll just to make sure everything is working. Um, how many kilonewtons do you all feel um, are required to fracture the ZMC? We'll give it a little bit more time. Okay, so a lot of people feel like it'd be 2.4 to 4 kilonewtons. So let's go and see what the correct answer is. Uh, so 0. 0.9 to 2.9 kilonewtons. Um, so probably a lot of you have seen this AO slide breaking down into uh, forces. And so you can see that uh, 0. 0.9 to 2.9 kilonewtons um, there. And the zygoma itself is actually a very strong bone. Um, this quote is, uh, was featured in one of Dr. Ellis's chapters in a textbook that um, I've gotten a lot of the images from. Um, but the malar bone represents a strong bone on fragile supports, and it is for, that, for this reason that the body of the bone is rarely broken. Um, so it doesn't actually take all that much force um, to break those other um, processes and suture lines. So highlighted here in the uh, teal is the zygoma, and uh, we have another poll question. I promise they're not going to be <laughs> rapid sequence all the time, just a little heavy at the beginning. Um, so which of the following is not a suture of the zygoma? A, frontozygomatic, B, zygomaticoterigoid, C, zygomaticomaxillary, and D, zygomaticosphenoid. 
We have about five, six responses. Maybe we can get 10 responses. It seems like the group has decided that B is the correct answer. All right, that's correct. B is the correct answer. So going through those processes or um, suture lines, um, so you can see the zygoma highlighted here, both in the um, frontal and profile view. So the first one um, is the frontozygomatic, um, by, shown by number one. Number two is the zygomaticosphenoid suture. Three, zygomaticomaxillary. And then on the profile view, you can see number four, the zygomaticotemporal. And all of these must be involved when we're thinking about a ZMC fracture. Um, so I think you can see my mouse here. Um, when we think about ZMC and the tetrapod fracture, it's a pretty predictable uh, fracture pattern. And so um, when teaching this, a lot of people talk about this inferior orbital fissure. And so if you start at the bottom of that and start to draw your fracture lines from there, so going superiorly and laterally up to number one, um, that's one fracture line and that's coming at that zygomaticosphenoid as well as the frontozygomatic suture. And then coming forward and straight down is the fracture at the zygomaticomaxillary uh, suture line. And then the fourth fracture then becomes the, the arch. And it's just a really important um, concept to get um, not only the general three-dimensional um, fit for the zygoma, um, but also those fracture lines. And then here I just wanted to point out the proximity of the infraorbital foramen uh, to that uh, fracture line, um, frequently involved within the fracture, and so it's important for you to evaluate that, and we'll talk about your exam in just a little bit. So the master muscle attachment is also very important when you're thinking about ZMC fractures. Um, it generally results in a predictable displacement of the ZMC. So there's an inferior displacement as that masseter um, it no longer has any opposition from those four articulations. And so it comes straight down and then an inferior and uh, medial rotation to the zygoma. Um, is typically what you're going to see um, when you see these patients. So going into uh, patient evaluation and history, um, all of you know how to take a comprehensive um, HPI um, and just some important things to establish are the timeline because that's going to impact um, when you're going to do your surgery or sometimes even if you're going to do a surgery if it's a very delayed um, time point. Um, the mechanism of injury whether or not the patient lost consciousness, especially if you're in a primary trauma survey setting, um, that would dictate um, some of the other imaging concerns or other things that you wanna rule out uh, before you really focus on their maxillofacial injuries. And then a whole host of um, kind of maxillofacial um, signs and symptoms that you want to elicit. So tristness, change in occlusion, uh, facial numbness, weakness, change in hearing, um, either clear or bloody otorrhea, rhinorrhea, epistaxis, any change in vision, uh, double vision, or pain with any eye movement. Moving on to the physical exam, as I mentioned before, um, if you find yourself in the trauma bay when you're called to evaluate this patient, um, it, it is a, the onus is upon you to make sure that all the other things have been done because um, you're not just there as the maxillofacial um, trauma surgeon, but you're also there just as a physician period. And so you need to make sure that you've uh, evaluated the patient and that the ABCs have been performed and, you know, on occasion, you know, you may be helping the trauma team um, go through this process. Once you've established that the patient is safe and a head and neck exam, you know, would be appropriate, then you would go ahead and perform that comprehensive exam, uh, which should include a general inspection, a thorough cranial nerve exam, otoscopy, anterior rhinoscopy, and a detailed exam of the oral cavity, including assessment of the occlusion. Within that comprehensive exam, the key exam features that you would want to pick up on when evaluating a ZMC fracture is trismus, 
Um, also, any malar flattening or facial asymmetry, uh, facial numbness, uh, palpable step-offs, uh, periorbital edema, enophthalmos and diplopia, as well as any other ocular injuries that you may be worried about in a orbital floor fracture because, as we discussed previously, that fracture pattern by definition is going to involve the orbital floor. So I just want to emphasize that the list that we just went over is not necessarily something that you need to memorize, but if you just consider the anatomy that we just reviewed, um, a lot of the signs and symptoms um, should be readily recalled. Um, so this block just represents a temporalis muscle, and so you can imagine at the zygomatico temporal suture line if there's a fracture there. Um, there's going to be some related edema, uh, inflammation of the temporalis muscle, and then even spasm that contributes to the trismus. Some authors also feel like that displacement of the fracture can actually impinge on the coronoid process, and so that could also contribute to trismus. And then um, here, just the little white lines represent the infraorbital nerve, and so you're going to want to think about facial numbness, depending on the involvement of the foramen with the fracture line and then you have the globe. And so that should help you key in on any of the ophthalmologic injuries or um, things that you need to rule out, uh, especially before proceeding for surgery. Um, and then just one note about the um, orbital rim here. It's very easy for patients to feel palpable or to feel bony step-offs. It just doesn't take much of a misalignment. And so um, it's very important that you as the physician are evaluating that and carefully palpating that region. As far as looking at uh, malar projection, um, sometimes there can be edema that may make your visual inspection difficult to really assess that. And so it's important for you to um, do a thorough examination, including palpation. Um, here is shown kind of a bird's eye view where you're looking down at the patient to assess their malar projection and also palpating those landmarks. Um, I more typically kind of do a, a get the exam chair up higher than me and look up and have the patient look up and look at it kind of from a base view uh, similar to what you look at in rhinoplasty. So after your physical exam, you then want to corroborate that exam with imaging. Um, so as you all know, uh, imaging of choice is typically a non-contrasted CT scan of the maxillofacial skeleton. Um, at a minimum, um, that should be at least three millimeters and really one millimeter cuts would be ideal. Um, and that's because we're really looking at the details in these, um, in these images and it really dictates what our operative plan should be. So things that you want to look at when you're reviewing the imaging is whether or not the fracture is displaced and by what degree is it displaced? Is it minimally displaced, largely displaced? Um, as well as whether or not there's any comminution of those displaced fragments. Uh, just a word of caution that when you're looking at 3D reconstructions, oftentimes that amount of comminution is uh, undercalled. And so um, you don't want to depend on that to uh, assess the comminution. So it's a, really a place where you have to thoroughly evaluate your coronal, uh, sagittal, and axial images. It's also a good opportunity to look at the orbital floor, see how extensive the orbital floor involvement is. If there's heavy comminution in that area or even missing bony fragments, then you may want to start thinking that if you put the zygoma in the correct position, whether or not you would have reconstituted that floor adequately uh, to preserve the orbital volume. And then there's also a number of classification schemes. And I, I think another lecture uh, covered this uh, earlier in this series. Um, but just to go over briefly, uh, the AO CMF classification. So level one is really a generalized uh, organization. So whether it's a mandible fracture, mid-face, skull base, or cranial vault. Level two goes in a little bit more detail into each of the level one uh, areas. And so for our discussion purpose, the mid-face is uh, divided into central lateral components, the NOE, LIFOR, as well as the orbit. And then each of those um, has further specification in the level three. Um, and so this is the map uh, for the level three classification. And you can see that the table um, starts with the level two um, indications, and then you can break this down into your level three areas that are involved. <clears throat> 
So surgical indications. So now you've really, you've identified, you know, what the patient's problems are. You've got a good history. Um, you've done a thorough exam and you've reviewed their imaging carefully. And now it's time to make a decision on whether or not you need to intervene in any way and whether that would benefit the patient. So the signs, symptoms, and functional impairment is really what dictates the need for intervention. Indications listed here are displaced fracture, comminution, uh, malar flattening, enophthalmos, and then I put trismus in uh, italics. The reason I did that, um, the other ones are pretty self-evident, but trismus, um, oftentimes that can be a major complaint the patient has. Um, but as all of you have probably heard from your mentors that operating on pain often creates pain for both the surgeon and the patient um, because we, we just don't do well when we're trying to relieve pain with surgery, especially in ZMC repair. Oftentimes the reduction uh, takes a little bit of force um, and you're manipulating um, the temporalis muscle as well um, and the masseter and so you can often make trismus worse for at least some period of time. And so trismus as a standalone indication is kind of a dangerous game to play and would really require a very thorough discussion between you and the patient, cautioning them that the resolution of trismus, you know, would be of question uh, after intervention. Another note I want to make on indications is um, probably one of the more common things we see is malar flattening or facial asymmetry with a displaced fracture. As I mentioned before, it can be hard to inspect the patient. Um, so that the edema can resolve and your ability to examine the patient can improve. I think my Internet cut out. Looks like I'm back. So, okay. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, and so, um, wait seven days, but you don't want to delay too much past ten days, um, as things can really start to set in and scar in at that point. And um, some authors also feel that there's masseter shortening that can happen um, past that 10 day mark. Um, in my experience, that hasn't been too much of an issue to address these after 10 days. And we'll, we'll talk about the masseter in a little bit more detail. So for those patients where there's not displacement, they don't have a lot of symptoms, um, you could definitely consider non-operative management or conservative management. Um, so this is a table I got from the from Dr. Ellis's chapter um, talking about ZMC fractures, and it, you know, it's a pretty large sample size when it's put all together, and anywhere from nine to forty-nine percent of these ZMC fractures ultimately did not require surgical intervention. Um, obviously, there'd be questions of kind of what was an appropriate outcome in these cases um, would be one criticism of many of these studies. And then the sample size uh, varies significantly, but some of these sample sizes are um, pretty sufficient. So if you've decided that surgery is indicated, um, then you have to consider kind of what surgical approaches you would want to use. And so this is a summary slide of all the approaches um, that I feel are key to ZMC management. So the sublabial incision is kind of the workhorse incision for ZMC. Um, it gives you great exposure of the zygomaticomaxillary uh, suture line and the, the lateral buttress. Um, and it also, um, with careful uh, retraction and dissection, uh, you can also inspect the inferior orbital rim. Um, difficult to plate that through the sublabial incision. It's not something that, that I do. Um, so I generally view it as a way to inspect the reduction at the inferior orbital rim. Gilly's temporal approach um, is also useful um, for reduction of the zygomatic arch. Um, you can also manipulate the full zygoma um, for a more involved fracture. Approaches to the frontozygomatic suture are either a lateral blepharoplasty incision or a brow incision. And we'll go through all of these in a little more detail. Um, Transconjunctival or subciliary incision to allow for both inspection and plating of the inferior orbital rim. Uh, 
uh, plus orbital floor exploration and treatment if you feel that's indicated. And then finally, to plate the zygomatic arch uh, would require a coronal uh, approach in most cases. So this is just an example of the exposure um, that you can get uh, with the sublabial incision. And just above that little blue plate, you can see the infraorbital nerve there. And you actually get that, you get to that height pretty quickly. So a few technical notes on performing a sublabial incision. Uh, one of the first things I like the residents to do is identify Stenson's duct, which should be adjacent to the second maxillary molar. Um, obviously, you don't want to injure the duct, and so that's why it's nice to get it identified up front. You're then going to make your mucosal incision in the gingival buccal sulcus, uh, taking care to make sure you leave enough of a cuff to suture your wound closed. Uh, continue with sharp dissection through the muscular layer, uh, generally with a bovie, and down perpendicular to the bone. Again, that helps uh, preserve a, a cuff of tissue for you. And then when you're making your, um, di or when you're progressing with your dissection, typically using a free or a number nine, you wanna be really meticulous with this elevation and take your time. Um, it's a great plane, it does elevate very quickly, but also with heavy comminution, it's easy for you to displace bony fragments. Um, and it, it's, um, you know, with your assistant potentially moving a little bit, it's very easy for you to displace one of those fragments and then they retract that up into the soft tissue with their toe in. Um, and specifically when you've done a good job studying your CT scan and you're kind of using these bony fragments as a roadmap, you know, to where you want your, what you want to expose, um, it can lead to a lot of difficulty and a lot more bleeding too if you're messing with the mucosa of the maxillary sinus unnecessarily. Um, so just take your time, palpate carefully with your instruments, um, and that should keep you out of trouble. One note on retraction. Um, everyone has their um, retractors of choice. I generally like a short toe-in um, that I position superiorly um, and medially. Um, so that's coming along the face of the maxilla and then getting a long either toe in or even a toe out um, behind the maxilla laterally um, gives great exposure um, for you to uh, work in terms of both reducing uh, the fracture as well as uh, being able to plate. And then when you're plating up high on kind of the body of the zygoma, oftentimes it's helpful to take out the short toe in and only use that one long toe in um, to get even more retraction so you can get a nice purchase of the bone um, when you're putting screws in or drilling. Um, another note on sublabial incision, if you're able to preserve the frenulum, um, some people talk about disrupting those nasolabial muscles and resulting in alar base with increase. Um, if you preserve that frenulum and you don't take it that medially, uh, a lot of times you can avoid some of those risks. And then also a note about uh, resuspending um, the malar mid-face soft tissue um, through a periosteal stitch um, is also considered. So Gilly's temporal approach um, is through the temporal scalp and um, it's more typically rather than manipulating a ZMC fracture, it's more typically used for closed reduction of an isolated arch fracture. And um, we'll talk more about the temporal and facial nerve anatomy in this area when I discuss the coronal approach. Um, but here they're using what's called a row a zygoma elevator through that temporal incision. Um, and it's featured here on the left side of the screen. The row elevator is my, my instrument of choice. Um, this blunt end here, I use it through the sublabial incision and you position that um, basically where the arch articulates with the body of the zygoma. This end out here is um, outside of the cheek and when the, when the elevator comes together, that loop tells you where your blunt end is inside the patient and so you know you're positioning pretty accurately. And then you use an overhanded grip on this side um, and, and use that to um, pretty, uh, pretty reliably reduce your fracture. And um, I've had really good luck with reducing fractures with this. Another, um, you can use a variety of instruments. Um, a Dingman elevator is also commonly used or even uh, ureteral sounds can sometimes be used in a pinch. 
And then on the right hand side of the screen is the Carol Gerard screw, which is inserted percutaneously and screwed into the body of the zygoma and that allows for uh, pretty ready manipulation. Um, downsides, uh, you know, there's downsides to all instruments. Some people feel the row elevator slips out too much or you don't have precise control of the movement as you would with a Carol Gerard. Um, but the screw can slip out. And then um, if you can't find, you know, the hole that you made, then you may have to create another hole in your zygoma, especially if there's heavy comminution, you may not have as much real estate there as you would like. Um, and then it also requires you to make a percutaneous uh, stab incision in order to place it. Um, you can also do it um, through your sublabial um, approach, um, but the, the angulation um, can be very difficult and can get in the way of your other instrumentation. So when I have used it, I've used it percutaneously. Um, between upper bluff incision and brow incision, um, people talk about some issues with the brow incision being that it's a little bit too high. And, um, and also you can get scarring that, though the incision itself is pretty inconspicuous within the hairline, um, if you damage any of those follicles, you can change the brow uh, a little bit. And then also, um, depending on the, the individual patient, there can be thinning of the brow laterally. And so you're not really gaining anything by positioning the incision higher. Uh, so I typically do an upper bluff incision. Uh, the way I mark the native supratarsal crease before any injection of local anesthetic. I make the incision with a 15 blade. Um, here, retraction is shown with wide double prong uh, skin hooks. Um, I have better luck with the sharp Sen retractors and um, that allows pretty ready dissection down to the bone, uh, to the fracture and suture line. Um, and you can expose that fracture using a variety of periosteal elevators. Um, once that rim is exposed, um, then I carefully dissect using a freer um, on the orbital side, um, and that's to gain exposure to the zygomaticosphenoid suture line, um, which can be really informative. And when I'm doing that dissection, I have a small malleable retractor, um, not really retracting the globe, more just protecting the globe while I'm doing that dissection. Um, so more about this approach and the when you're looking at the frontozygomatic suture, um, when you reduce the fracture there, it tells you a lot, not only about the vertical axis rotation, but also the AP reduction. And then when you look further back down onto the orbital side and you can see the articulation with the sphenoid bone, that gives you really great information about the, um, on the vertical axis, about the rotation of the zygoma. And so if I'm doing this approach, oftentimes I'll be visualizing the reduction there um, while somebody else is doing the reduction through the sublabial approach. And um, it can be, um, it's really a game changer in, in terms of being able to be confident about your reduction. Uh, briefly about a transconjunctival approach, there's two options which you all have heard, preceptal and retroceptal approaches. Um, typically, I use what's called an insulated Jaeger lid plate to track the globe and make an incision with a Colorado uh, bovi tip just through the conjunctiva on a very low setting, uh, typically five or eight, and then um, blunt dissection after that through the orbital fat because I do more typically do a retroceptal approach. And then once I can visualize that inferior rim, uh, just make a small periosteal incision, elevate the periosteum, and then um, then you're there at your rim, and you have the option to explore your orbital floor as well. I'd like to bring everybody's attention to this article by Dr. Frodo and Marin Tett. Uh, it's a really great paper on the coronal approach. And um, I think it's not, it's, it's very well written. The illustrations are great, um, but it helps you not only be comfortable with the coronal approach itself, but also understand the anatomy uh, specifically of the facial nerve. So the coronal approach is shown here. And um, typically an incision, um, you can either do preauricular or postauricular, more commonly preauricular um, incision going down through the galea and then you're going to elevate 
in a subgaleal plane, leaving your pericranium down. If you look on the left side of your screen, um, you're reflecting that flap. I'm going through this briefly because we, most fractures, ZMC fractures, don't um, require this approach. Um, but you leave pericranium down and you elevate um, in your subgaleal plane and do that pretty confidently until you come to the temporalis muscle. And um, that's really where you want to make sure that you thoroughly understand the anatomy here. So if you look over at this coronal cut, again, from uh, Dr. Frodo's paper, when you're elevating, you're elevating that loose areolar tissue up and you want to recruit all of that stuff up towards the temporal parietal fascia. And so you're skating along here on that deep temporal fascia, and you should see the temporal muscle deep to you. And so in blunt dissection, you recruit all of this up into this flap here, and you continue that dissection until you get to the temporal fat pad. Um, this is where there's a lot of differences, um, sometimes based off specialty, um, but some people feel the only way to keep this safe is to go through this fat pad and that can lead to a lot of temporal hollowing and um, that's not necessarily an appropriate morbidity from this approach. Um, more typically you can come and stay on that deep temporal fascia and I'll show you on the next slide um, a little bit better look at that. Um, but you keep the frontal branch safe by staying down on this uh, temporal fascia and then about a centimeter before you get to the arch, and usually you're at the posterior arch, then you can make a small incision and enter that plane to make sure that your frontal branch is safe. And so you work from posterior to anterior, freeing up this from the uh, zygomatic arch. Um, I hope I did an okay job articulating that. Um, like I said, I think the, the paper does a phenomenal job with that. So this is a look at the frontal nerve at different positions. So when we're here, uh, just over the arch, we can see that the facial nerve is just deep to temporal parietal fascia or just within deep temp uh, temporal parietal fascia. And then as we go above the arch, now we have the temporalis showing up in that cut. And then further up, we see that the nerve, um, as it does for most uh, uh, muscles of facial expression, innervates at the deep side of the frontalis muscle. So more about our intervention. So reduction and fixation are obviously key points to managing these fractures. Um, so the question becomes, how do we know if we've adequately reduced the ZMC fracture? Most people agree that you have to look at at least three of those four articulations that we talked about at the very beginning um, in order to accurately assess whether or not you've performed a quality reduction. Sometimes you can be tempted, you know, by palpating at the inferior orbital rim or at the arch or at the uh, uh, frontal suture. And palpation is a really dangerous substitute for direct visualization. Um, and also intraoperative CT imaging. So here, I think this is kind of the shining star is intraoperative CT because it allows you to get that direct information about the all four suture lines in the, of the zygoma and potentially reduces the number of approaches that you need to do. And we'll talk about how to decide, you know, what fixation needs to be done. So um, looking at intraoperative imaging, um, this is a study that looked at the review of literature based on intraoperative imaging. And you can see outside of this one study that did ultrasound, um, there were multiple studies looking at CT scans and some of them did show revisions of reduction rates um, and then up to 10% you know, and 20% of those um, that looked at that had a revisions of those reductions. And so I think it can be really powerful. So the question is, you know, do, once we are happy with our reduction, do we need rigid fixation? And that seems like kind of a silly question. Like, of course we would need to fixate that, um, but that's just not always necessary. 
And so when we're looking at whether reduction alone could be an appropriate treatment, we have to consider these things. So once we reduce the fracture, is that zygoma still unstable? If there's any instability, then you may want to consider fixation. Um, and then the other thing to look at is comminution. We know that a clean fracture, once it's reduced, is going to settle in differently than if there's comminution on both sides. There's not going to be anything locking that bone into place. And so generally speaking, if there's a comminuted fragment, then you're going to want to plate that. And then the other thing is, you know, how, what is the action of the masseter muscle after a reduction? And this has been debated a lot. Um, so I'm curious what you all think about that. Um, does the, ma ma true or false, the master maintains its strength following a ZMC fracture, and it's a significant contributor, excuse me, uh, to post-reduction displacement? I'll give you all uh, a minute or so to respond. So people say true so far. We'll see if anyone else responds. So false is actually the right answer here. So um, the study on the left side, the effects of zygomatic uh, complex on the masseteric muscle force uh, compared two groups of patients, um, one with a ZMC fracture and one without it, and looked out up to four weeks after the fracture and measured the bite force um, from the master muscle and found that even up to four weeks after the injury, the master muscle function um, had not regained uh, normalcy and um, not even close. And so another study I think that points to the master not having too much of an effect after reduction on the right side is uh, analysis done by Dr. Ellis where they looked at 48 ZMC patients um, and that included uh, closed reduction and one anywhere from one to four point fixation and none of the patients in that series had a change in the position of the ZMC based off of uh, post-operative imaging that was obtained um, after repair. And so um, in that series, though, I think it's important to note that only, only one of the 48 were purely closed reduction. Other ones had some form of fixation. Um, but generally, you would think that if, um, if the master always had a reliably negative impact on our reduction, that four-point fixation would always do better than one-point fixation um, because there's still mobility there. Uh, but we, we just didn't see that in this series, at least. So once you've determined that you need rigid fixation, you have a lot of choices, um, whether to do one-point fixation or four-point fixation. So single plate fixation, um, as demonstrated um, in the surger AO surgery reference, um, can be at just the lateral buttress or the zygomatico maxillary suture, um, but also could be done at the uh, frontozygomatic suture line as well. Two plate fixation, either at the ZM and um, ZF or the ZM and the rim. Three plate fixation as shown here with the addition of the inferior orbital rim plate. And then this is a four plate fixation. Uh, how many plates you need um, is a challenging question. Um, I think that Um, it is a challenging question. Um, so there's been a lot of different studies here. So uh, Dr. Champe um, had a single plate fixation series of 340 patients and only had six that had an unsatisfactory result. 
And so, you know, I think there's a temptation to think that more fixation means a better result. And I think that there's um, a number of studies that show that that's not necessarily the case. Going back to that other analysis of ZMC fractures, again, I want to point out that that had a full spectrum of um, cases from just closed reduction to a four-point fixation, and they had um, no migration of the zygoma. Um, so I think that in terms of how many points of fixation, it has to be a clinical decision that you make for each patient. If there's heavy comminution at you know, three of the four areas, and you may need to do more aggressive plating. Um, or if you're planning on a two plate fixation, but there's still a lot of mobility, then that may push you to do a three plate fixation. And so I think it's important to just know what your indications are for plating those individual sites. So quick note on managing the orbital floor. Um, most agree that there's not, routine exploration is not ne necessary. Um, but again, a point I brought up at the very beginning is that you want to carefully inspect the preoperative CT scans in order to see how heavily involved the orbital floor is. And, um, and I do think that 3D reconstruction does a great job here is, you know, if you could imagine that zygoma in the correct position, would that um, address your floor defect? And oftentimes it will. Um, and then if you're using intraoperative CT scan for things like uh, confirming the reduction, um, then you could also look obviously at the floor and see how well you reduced it there. So I'm gonna wrap up with a couple of case presentations. Um, just a quick disclaimer, I, I'm using, in the cases I use a lot of 3D images, but I, I fully believe that you should be reviewing your regular axial coronal sagittal cuts, building a picture of that in your own head, and then um, reviewing or confirming with a 3D rendering afterwards. So this is our patient uh, came in, had been assaulted. Um, so just curious kind of what kind of things that you would want to know about his presentation. Yeah, so knowing if they had prior trauma is a good question, and, and he had had prior trauma. Perfect. These are all good answers. Yep. Um, so this patient happened to have prior trauma, including a well-healed laceration at the right uh, infrabrow. Um, he was assaulted with fist. Um, this actually happened three weeks ago. He did lose consciousness, but had a thorough workup. Um, and yeah, so I think the timeline was here. So three weeks, um, but just based off of my physical exam, you know, I did feel that um, he did have a significant um, facial asymmetry and he did have trismus as well. Great. So these are his uh, CT scans. is axial we're going through now. And then here's his 3D reconstruction. So we can say that this is a true ZMC fracture on the right side. It is significantly displaced, particularly at the zygomatico-maxillary suture line and the inferior orbital rim. Um, it's significantly rotated as well. And um, if you went back to the 2D imaging, um, there's just minimal comminution at the inferior orbital rim, not very much. <laughs> 
So, um, and we'll just kind of talk through this. So, and I'll give you guys some time to reflect, you know, is this an operative fracture? And would you be able to tell me why it is an operative fracture? So what are the indications for operating on this? I mentioned that this was three weeks out. So when would you do the surgery? Would you just let it heal? Or would you try to reduce it? What approaches, even before you get to the operating room, would you imagine needing to do in order to fully assess the reduction? Some of that depends on whether or not you anticipate having intraoperative CT as an option. And then finally, you know, what would you plate? So you know you want to, you know, it needs to be reduced, um, and you have a plan of when to do that. What do you think would need to be plated? So I'll just give you all a minute to look at the Im imaging again to consider those options. So we, we decided to operate. Um, he had that pre-existing brow laceration, so we utilized that. And then um, we, like I said, the sublabial is the workhorse, and I get post-op imaging on all of my patients. And I know that went a little bit fast, but pretty um, happy with the reduction. We did do a two-plate fixation, um, so we did the ZM. And then, like I said, we use that existing brow laceration to look at the uh, frontal suture line as, and well as inspect the sphenoid um, suture and we're able to reduce that nicely and plated it there. So that's his pre-op uh, photo on the left side and his post-op on the right side, one week out from surgery. And you can see that there's um, improved symmetry of the malar projection and contour on the right side. So second case, um, I just want you all to look at that imaging. And then if you will, through your open response, uh, describe the fracture. And I tested it, you can do like pretty detailed uh, response here. So is it displaced? Is there comminution? If so, where's that comminution? Yeah, I agree with that. It's a displaced ZMC fracture. There is comminution along the ZM. Yep, perfect. Yeah, so I think everyone's coming up with the, the same um, description. So this is a left ZMC fracture. There's comminution at the maxilla, at the rim, as well as at the greater wing of the sphenoid. And it appears to me that the facial width is widened as well. So this is how this was repaired. Um, so things to think about um, would be what approach was used. Can you tell from the plating what approaches the surgeons used? Uh, I think you can see it well, but the, the ZM is plated and the inferior orbital rim is plated. Yeah, so definitely use the sublabial. Yep. Any other incisions? Yeah, transconge or, or subciliary approach or a rim incision. Yeah, good. So the question then is, were those the right approaches to use and should any other approaches have been used? So kind of carefully critiquing this repair, um, you know, what are the problems that we can identify here? Um, this was not a good reduction um, at the, and we'll zoom in here, but you can see that particularly at that zygomaticosphenoid suture, the, there's still lateral displacement of the zygoma. 
I think that if a brow incision or upper bluff incision was done and allowed for direct inspection of that sphenoid suture, that this displacement would have been identified. And you should be able to draw a number of conclusions from just looking at this one spot. So we know that this zygoma is still laterally displaced, or at least uh, twisted on the vertical axis. In order for that to happen, it must be under projected here. And for that to all be true, it has to be widened here at the arch. And then we see that here on a base view of that 3D reconstruction that the arch is still kicked out and the malar projection is um, not appropriate. So um, this emphasizes what I was talking about before, how powerful that direct inspection of the zygomaticosphenoid suture can be and can be really informative. This is kind of a concluding remarks about the topic of ZMC. So this was a study um, that gave four different sets of images um, to different surgeons from different backgrounds, OMFS, ENT, and plastics all with different amounts of experience. And the amount of variance in terms of what patients needed surgery, what type of surgery, what approaches, what needed to be played was really significant. So I just put this there to let you all know that there's going to be a lot of complex ZMC fractures. Even amongst people in your department, there's going to be arguments or disagreements about what the ideal treatment plan is. Um, and you know what you need to play it versus what you don't need to play it. And so I just encourage you all to think about the anatomy and know your indications for surgery well, and just be able to articulate why you're doing something if you do decide um, to either play it or not play it, just be able to um, argue you know, why it is you're doing that. So finally, the key points, um, ZMCs are very common and they can be tough to do well. Understanding the anatomy and the tetrapod concept is key to obtaining excellent results. Um, planning your approaches um, can help make sure that you can properly assess your reduction, which you, you saw is very important. Never rely on palpation um, to assess your reduction and make sure that preoperatively you're looking for comminution on your CT scan and intraoperatively be honest about how much mobility there is because um, that will keep you safe in terms of determining the number of plates you need to use. And intraoperative imaging is a great adjunct tool. Um, so sorry for going a little bit longer. Um, uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, so I got a couple of questions. Um, so um, it's a it's a great question you ask about ophthalmology seeing uh, our ZMC fractures. Um, so at Bintob, which is our level one trauma center, uh, we just went through a process where we um, got together with ophthalmology, uh, plastic surgery, and OMFS to come up with a algorithm for treating um, orbital fractures. And uh, ophthalmology, um, you know, we just want to utilize their resources appropriately. And they actually deem ZMC as an indication for urgent ophthalmology um, consultation. So when we looked into that more, um, there is a wide variety of reported significant or severe ophthalmologic injuries with ZMC fracture. Um, and the range was like crazy, like something from like 9 to 90%. Um, and so we, we felt that ZMCs are way too common to have that much ambiguity with that problem. And so um, at, at that center, we're actually working with ophthalmology on a study right now. Um, so as of right now, yes, I have ophthalmology see all of those patients, um, but we'll see kind of where that, where that data ends up. Any other questions or comments?
All right. Well, thanks everybody for your attention. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll let go of the screen now. That was great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.